Induction a posteriori would have brought phrenology to admit an innate and primitive principle of human action, a paradoxical something, which we may call perverseness, for want of a more characteristic term. In the sense I intend, it is, in fact, a mobile without a motive, a motive not motivert. Through its promptings, we act without comprehensible object, or, if this shall be understood as a contradiction in terms, we may so far modify the proposition as to say that through its promptings, we act for the reason that we should not. In theory, no reason can be more unreasonable, but in fact, there is none more strong. With certain minds, under certain conditions, it becomes absolutely irresistible. I am not more certain that I breathe than that the assurance of the wrong or error of any action is often the one unconquerable force which impels us, and alone impels us to its prosecution. Nor will this overwhelming tendency to do wrong for the wrong's sake admit of analysis or resolution into ulterior elements. It is a radical, a primitive impulse, elementary. Welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Mind, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hey, welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Mind. My name is Robert Lamb. And I'm Joe McCormick. And if you recognize that opening reading, you must be into the deep cuts of Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, this story didn't even have him burying anybody alive. Yeah, this is this is not uh, like you say. This is this is not going to be a hit single from Poe by any means. This is this is more of a deep cut. Uh, You're probably far more familiar with the Telltale Heart or the Black Cat, uh, two stories that contain similar elements, and then we'll touch on later in this episode. Yeah, so this is from Edgar Allan Poe's 1845 short story, The Imp of the Perverse. And we start with this today because in this short story, Poe brings up this concept of the imp of the perverse or this uh, this motive toward perversity, the idea of doing something exclusively for the reason that you know it should not be done and not for any other reason. And in this story, The Imp of the Perverse, uh, there is actually a murder. You you don't get to the murder for a while. Poe (laughs) makes you wait. uh, Before before any plot, there's just this long musing complete with lots of references to the pseudoscience of phrenology. uh, But it's amusing on this particular impulse of perverseness, the powerful urge to do what we should not and to do it simply for the reason that it should not be done. And so Poe goes on to analyze this concept uh, th- throughout this sort of essay section of the story. Uh, he calls it a radical, primitive impulse, uh, and he contrasts it with other types of drives that we have, which he frames in terms of the pseudoscience of phrenology again. He says it's different from mere combativeness because combativeness stems from an instinct for self-defense, right? It's rooted in the desire to be well and to protect yourself from injury. So Poe writes, quote, but in the case In the case of that something which I term perverseness, the desire to be well is not only not aroused, but a strongly antagonistical sentiment exists. So I take that to mean he's trying to make clear he's not talking about any kind of self-defensive combativeness or antagonism, but rather a kind of suicidal antagonism, a thwarting of one's own best interests simply because you have a desire to do something that you shouldn't do. Now, the example that Poe uh, uses here, of course, is one that I think most of us can't directly relate to. Uh, The the idea of of this impulse to confess a secret murder that you committed. But the the idea of being tempted to do something that you absolutely know you shouldn't do, like for for no logical reason other than that's not in your own interest. Yeah. Right. Like, I think we can all relate to that on some level. Like, I often think about this kind of thing when I'm in meetings. If I'm, say, in like a one-on-one meeting with my boss, like say it's a, a, you know, a performance review or, you know, what have you, I'll suddenly, I'll be sitting there nodding, listening, uh, absorbing the information, and then like this random thought will occur like, what if I lick the desk right now? Yes. (laughs) Yes. You know, <laughs> what if what if I started eating an ink pen, uh-huh. not just chewing on it, but just like really, uh, you know, chowing down on it? And I'm not logically tempted to do these things, but then once the, the idea is in my mind, uh, I just keep thinking about it. 
I mean, it, it's different from – like there are two very different ways to have a desire to say something inappropriate during a meeting with one's boss or mm -hmm. something. One reason would be, well, maybe you've, you know, you've got all these kinds of pent-up feelings about your boss and you're very angry and you mm -hmm. think you've been wronged or something like that. And then that would be a sort of natural desire to express your feelings and rebel against some kind of injustice or get revenge by saying what right. you really think. That would be one thing. You're talking about something different and Poe's talking about something different. When when all those feelings aren't even necessarily there, just wanting – having this impulse to say something or do something completely inappropriate for no good reason at all. Right. I know exactly what you're talking about. I often have this thought when I'm in like a, a, a meeting or, you know, something's going on. Sometimes something just flashes into my head like I could utter the following sentence and it would destroy my career. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or or just you think like, well, what if I like crab walked out of this meeting mm -hmm. right now? You know, it wouldn't be that difficult to do, and yet it would totally uh, it would it would totally uh, change everyone's perceptions of how I uh, uh, you know how I experience reality and uh, you know the seriousness with which I take my job, that sort of thing. Um, and and I and I guess as, as we'll come back to uh, in this episode, a lot of it comes down to just that that weird dividing line between thought and action. Yeah, yeah. It's almost as if whenever you do this, you're exploring what it means to contemplate an action without doing it. It's kind of the same way. It's almost like you're feeling the texture of something in those moments where you wonder what it would be like to swerve into oncoming traffic or to jump off of a tall ledge. I mean, you. I remember a while back you did an episode with Chris question about the idea of the call of the void. And I think this touches on some similar stuff, right? It's not necessarily mm -hmm. that uh, people – I mean, people do have suicidal ideation that is – uh, more deeply rooted in in, in uh, ongoing problems they have. But there's also just these sort of like momentary fleeting impulses that don't even seem to be connected to anything larger. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, – I, I, I definitely recommend uh, listeners go back to that episode because uh, we touched on not only you know, how that we get these ideas – uh, in our head, this weird temptation when we're say, at, uh, you know, at, atop a tall building or on a cliffside. But uh, I, in that episode, I shared how in the past I've also felt like this weird feeling like I need to press my wallet to the bottom of my pocket for fear that I'll take my wallet out and say, throw it, throw it over the the, the railing of the Empire State Building. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, which is something I, I definitely don't want to do. But then once the idea has entered my head, it does sort of feel like I should take steps to keep it from happening. Yeah, and you almost feel like you wonder for a second, am I going to be able to stop myself? Yeah. In this long section where Poe talks about uh, the idea of peering into an abyss in, in uh, the story, he says, quote, There is no passion in nature so demoniacally impatient as that of him who, shuddering upon the edge of a precipice, thus meditates a plunge. To indulge for a moment in any attempt at thought is not to be inevitably lost, for reflection but urges us to forbear, and therefore it is, I say, that we cannot. If there be no friendly arm to check us— or if we fail in a sudden effort to prostrate ourselves backwards from the abyss, we plunge and are destroyed. So it's this weird thing where he's almost like saying, you got to depend on some kind of part of you to suddenly be the guard. What if that part of you, the guard, isn't paying attention in some mm. moment? I believe I mentioned this in the Call of the Void episode, but stuff like this always makes me think of uh, uh, the author Robert Graves, his uh, partial auto uh, autobiography, Goodbye to All That. Mm -hmm. uh, where he talks about his experiences in the war, uh, but also of uh, mountain climbing. And uh, if memory serves, there's this one part where he talks about climbing, scaling these, uh, you know, the, these cliff sides with some friends, and how like the scariest moment was when birds were sailing close by, and the, and having to sort of wrestle with this this weird illogical feeling of love, what have I let go? What if what if like the birds were sort of tempting them? with mm. this uh, siren song of like, you know, let go and fly, fly with us. I don't know if this is inspired by that, but I seem to recall a, a kind of stock scene in a lot of cartoons, like Wile E. Coyote type mm -hmm. cartoons, where a character, often the kind of bumbling, uh, you know, prone to injury kind of character who would be out over a ledge on a precipice or on a tightrope or something and would be 
harassed by a bird fluttering <laughs> fluttering around nearby. Uh-huh. That there's something that does seem to go deep about you being vulnerable at the edge and then a, a creature that has powers that you can't just floating around as light as a breeze. Oh, yeah. I've definitely experienced it, say, standing uh, at the edge of the, the Grand Canyon. Well, not the edge. Uh, <laughs> several feet back. Uh, but still watching a bird uh, traverse these uh, to this drastic uh, change in elevation uh, with, without any uh, uh, issue at all. Now, personally, Robert, do, do you find yourself to be, I think the term would be crimnophobic, having a fear of sharp drop-offs and precipices? 